everyone. Welcome back to another week of Bulletproof Hygiene. I'm so excited to have you joining us this week. And before we really get going deep, I want to just remind you, if you haven't yet signed up for our annual summit that is coming up in June, um, we'll be hosting it out in Scottsdale, Arizona, June 14th and 15th. And you don't want to miss this, I promise. Come with your whole team because that is how dentistry is done when we do it really well together. So if you want more information, check us out at bulletproofsummit.com. I hope to see you there. So today I'm very excited about this podcast and this episode. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Emily Stein. She is a PhD microbiologist that received her undergrad degree at University of Iowa and then proceeded to get her PhD through UC Berkeley and then did her pro post-grad work at Stanford. She is currently the technical CEO at Primal Health, where she has developed what appears to be a revolutionary approach to addressing dental disease through modulation of the biofilms, thus creating balance and harmony within the oral systemic connection. As a microbiologist, she has a unique non-dental perspective that is really important for us as hygienists to understand when it comes to biofilm and how we can do a better job in managing a healthy commensurate biofilm. I'm going to warn you that this podcast may be a bit disarming as we come to realize that some of our current standards of care are not as impactful as we may think, but I'm hoping that by the end of the show, we can all ascribe to the beautiful quote from Maya Angelou that says, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. So without further ado, Dr. Stein, welcome to the show. I'm so grateful to have you with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Will you do us a favor and just share your background in microbiology and how you got focused on oral bacteria specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I first fell in love with bacteria as an undergrad at the University of Iowa. I was, you know, while everybody else was at the bars on a Friday night. I was in a biosafety, bio biohazard suit on a BSL-2 working with multi-drug resistant um, tuberculosis. <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, basically was fascinated by something you can barely see and that could kill you. And it, it you know, that microbe in particular lives in the lungs um, silently for decades before it pops back out and really causes harm. And so... I wanted to kind of really understand how microbes work and how they kind of lurk and use their host um, to their own advantage. And so then I went and spent six years nerding out in soil bacteria where I worked on um, uh, community formation. You, you know, in medicine, we call it biofilm. Um, but really microbes are social beings and they, they live in a community. And I was working on a species of organism that literally you can't culture it without, um, many of its brethren because it won't grow. Um, it's that social. And so I studied how it, these microbes work together, um, to survive nurture, nutrient deprivation, exposure to radiation, um, exposure to reactive oxygen species and antibiotics and antiseptics. So it's, it was the perfect like uh, underpinning for what I'm doing now. And, and when I was a postdoc at Stanford, I was studying rheumatology, which is where your immune system, you know, uh, starts to attack its own body, your own body. So we were actually studying periodontal disease as a surrogate because I was in joint um, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and that, and there was always a connection between RA and perio. Yes. And that's when my grandmother who had RA, RA um, had a stroke because she had a tooth pulled the day before and she had perio too. And so she was a statistic because a uh, retrospective analysis of thousands of Medicare claims have shown there's this relationship between a tooth extraction or a dental implant placement. Uh, so there's a 50% increased risk of a stroke or a heart attack within four weeks after that procedure. There's a, you know, and, and the, the reason is that the microbes, yeah, you know, obviously there's a lot of bleeding during those procedures. The microbes go inside the bloodstream. And for my grandmother, they went, you know, right up her, uh, the main, one of the major vascular highways into her brain and she threw a clot and that changed her life. So I, uh, changed my life because of it. So I started to biohack my grandma's oral microbes to stop them from causing additional problems. And that's how I got into this. Wow. Wow. 
Well, I, I hate to hear that it was such a tragic reason, but to your point, I don't think that we necessarily always realize in dentistry the adverse effects of the actions we take. And we can think, oh gosh, we're doing the patient a favor because this tooth is infected and we're taking it out. But what we now know and understand, and the stats are telling us that 50% of heart attack and strokes are, are started by an oral microbe, an oral pathogen these days. So I think it's so, so important for us to all wrap our heads around how important this biofilm is in the mouth and what it can do from a systemic standpoint. So I'm so excited to have you joining us and helping us. So I have to be honest and say that when I started out as a baby hygienist, and honestly, for far too long into my career, I truly had this like mental picture of the bad bacteria, you know, and I knew they were like the gram negative rods and the spirochetes, but I, I kind of viewed them as, you know, a handful of them just kind of living down below the gum line and that sulcus and, and that, you know, I almost envisioned that I would go in with my scaler or my ultrasonic and just scoop them out and flush them away. And I thought I was killing them and, and, you know, getting them out and, you know, telling my patients what to do on their home care front. So they, they didn't come back in and rebuild. And, you know, sadly, as you know, that was a very naive mental and clinical approach to addressing something so much bigger and way more serious. Um, I've since had the pleasure of working with a microscope to actually see the bacteria present, how active they are, how numerous they are from just the tiniest plaque sample of the mouth. Um, you know, it's just absolutely teeming with very active modal bacteria and it blew my mind. So that being said, Help us start at the foundation for all of this and, and give us a lesson on biofilm in the oral environment. You know, what does that truly look like? Yeah. So <clears throat> imagine a jungle like the Amazon, but at a microscopic level. And that is basically what inhabits the mouth. You can't see it unless it really builds up, which is tooth plaque or a, a thick biofilm on the tongue. But they're there. And they've always been there. It is the second most abundant space for ecosystem for microbes, um, aside from the colon. You know, we all know how dirty that is. Um, but what I want to basically touch on is the fact that these microbes have been there when we were in our mom's womb. So we co develop with them. And if you look at all the human elements of the body, including the mouth, only about 10 percent ish is human. The rest is really microbial. Um, and so they are constantly uh, growing and constantly eating things and constantly secreting things um, that our body absorbs. So it's 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 not what you feed yourself. It's really what you feed your microbes that dictate what they do. And so, um, you know, just to kind of really drive it home, they're living in the pulp of a tooth has its own microbiome. The vasculature in a tooth has its own microbiome. Uh, blood is not sterile. Um, bone, the alveolar bone is colonized. Um, so everything we were taught in medicine and dentistry isn't quite right. Well, and I feel like we get as hygienists, you know, we all, everybody, you know, depending on what aspect of profession you're in, you know, we all tend to get very, you know, focused on your own lane. And I feel like hygienists, we get really focused. We understand perio is an epidemic and we're really looking at that. But I think we get very focused on, like I said, that sulcus, just those little pockets down around the teeth. And we don't, aren't thinking that we've got the tonsil, we've got the palate, we've got the tongue, we've got all these other spaces that we're not spending that same amount of time on to try and disrupt. And then really, what's the reality of just disru truly disrupting anyway? Speak to that for me. Yeah, boy, you nailed it. Um, so this is, I don't want to like make everybody sad, but <laughs> when we brush our teeth or floss, we move the bacteria around and detach them from a surface, but they reattach within two minutes. And even though we spit things out, like even after a dental cleaning, the burden goes down by, you know, a tiny percent, but is measurable. Um, but it, they'll creep back up within a couple of weeks to the original number, um, unless you do a massive 
shift of the biofilm, which is kind of where what we're trying to focus on is who's living there. We know all those spaces are going to be occupied, period. Um, you know, you can do that you within like a couple of days after Profi, there's microbes really going to town, establishing their new homes, you know, and you just want to make sure that they're the good microbes making their home instead of the bad, bad microbes making homes because microbes make homes. Correct. Just like humans have shelter, microbes need shelter too. Uh, but the cool thing is microbes make shelter out of our diet. And so there's a lot that can be done um, in the, when you're in the trenches, just educating patients on their diet and diet decisions. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think so many times, you know, our patients, admittedly, I, outside of our patients, us as professionals, I don't think we totally understand how big this all is. Patients especially don't understand. So patients are thinking, well, you know, I brush and floss and I, you know, I get this out and, and we're thinking there are over 700 different types of bacteria that can live in your mouth. And I say yeah. to patients all the time, my goal is not to sterilize your mouth. That's not obtainable. And it's not the goal because true health is having good, healthy bacteria. Like you said, we are honestly pretty alienistic considering how many bacterial and microbe cells we have in our body versus our own human cells. Mm -hmm. um, so the goal is to build that really healthy, what we call commensurate biofilm, the good stuff, because that is truly what health is. Yeah. And protects you yes. and helps regulate your immune system and keeps your immune system tolerant of your own tissue. And we see that patients lose that tolerance when they get a dysbiosis, which is a fancy word for too many harmful, not enough beneficial in a biofilm. And um, really that's, that's um, I think the next phase of opportunity in dentistry for systemic health. Yeah. So as we wrap our heads around how large of a population this is and how variant it is, depending on what tissue and what structure, mm -hmm. you know, how extensively it thrives. I say to patients all the time, you know, after I've done therapy, I almost envision it as a, as an anthill that we've kicked over. And if you've ever watched that, you kick it over and the ants are just, you know, running like crazy to rebuild. I mean, that's kind of what's, I feel like visually what's happening in the mouth as we do that. Um, and then we think about how much real estate it takes up. I want to ask some hard questions about how impactful our current efforts are when it comes to trying to manage this, because I think for decades, we've thrown fluoride and minerals at trying to stop decay, but is caused by strep mutans. We've thrown scalars and ultrasonics and lasers and medicaments, antibiotics, rinses and probiotics at periodontal disease, um, you know, trying to break up those biofilms and killing the pathogens to rebuild a, a good, healthy baseline flora. And like you said, we know that studies show that the bacteria repopulate back to their original numbers within two to seven days after all of our efforts. So, you know, we think, well, why are we st still seeing disease when we've got all these tools and approaches, but what are we missing? What is, and I know you said diet is a huge part of this, right? Mm -hmm. So I will tell you, I have the, um, gift of getting to coach hygienists. And I know many hygienists that tell me they don't feel like they have either the time in their appointments or the knowledge to really dig into diet with their patients. They almost feel like that's taboo. Like, you know, I don't want to talk to them about their weight or their diet. You know, that seems a little personal, but I know that based on your research and findings, that this is one of the main things we've got to understand and discuss to help our patients understand when it comes to getting to the root of dental disease. So help us understand why this matters so much, that it's not just as simple as, you know, oh, you ate a piece of candy or, you know, you have a sweet tooth or you're drinking soda that it leads to decay. It's, it's a much bigger process than that. Oh yeah. <clears throat> so taking a step back, I'm going to, going to say something that most folks won't like, but, uh, what we're taught to give our kids as a healthy diet, which is juice or fruits actually is really problematic from a, not only tooth decay standpoint, but gingival um, health and integrity. Cause when you think about things that have a high sugar content plus acid at the same time, that's a two pronged uh, driver of creating this environment in the mouth that enables certain microbes, which are acid tolerant to really go and grow really quickly. 
in that kind of environment. And it, and it makes it much more difficult for the beneficial microbes, which grow on alternative um, sources of carbon, which are maybe non-sugar related. Uh, makes it much harder for them to hang in there. So they actually can get outcompeted by simple things like an orange juice every morning or orange juice and apple and, you know, banana, anything super starchy uh, or sweet and acidic um, definitely play a role. And also the evolution of fast food and processed foods. I can't, as a microbiologist who spent now, I don't know, a quarter, you know, 25 years in microbiology tell you what microbes are, are turning certain of these process chemicals into waste products or intermediates that do X because we don't even know. And that's our understanding of nutrition is based on the understanding of our mitochondria, which is only 10% of the equation. Right. And so there's 90% of this unknown that is consuming what we're eating and turning it into all these intermediates and final waste products that could completely be mutagenic or, you know, and um, you're seeing cancer rates go sky high these days. You're seeing um, inflammatory diseases going sky high these days. And I think a lot of it's due to what we're feeding our microbes. Yeah. Talk to us about the process. So, I know that there are different pathogens that drive decay versus yes. drive perio. Yes. Does the diet seem to be affecting both similarly? Yes. So, um, okay. So there's this massive food web in the mouth and the primary eaters are the, are the ones that can eat simple compounds like sucrose, fructose, lactose, glucose, um, all the oses, which are, um, are, um, simpler sugars, uh, they ferment or go through oxidative phosphorylation, which is fancy metabolic pathways to basically take that sugar, strip it down, harness the energy and spew out organic acids like acetic acid, uh, valeric acid, propionic, propionic acid and butyric acid, which then feed the next phase of microbes that are linked to gum disease. So you have not only, um, sugar, if you eat a high sugar diet, not only are you causing massive acid production by these little acid factories that coat every single surface of your mouth, but then they're also making the byproducts that are, uh, food sources for the next phase, which is the gum disease causing microbes. And you have these um, microbes that actually participate both in cavities and gum disease. Um, and those are candida and fun fungi and, and no one's really talking about those guys as well. So it's not just the red complex or the purple complex or the orange complex or the green complex. It's actually a much more complicated food web that is driving inflammation, leaky gums and demineralization in the mouth, um, based off of a heavy, uh, processed sugar, carbohydrate rich diet. And so that's why anything leafy and green that can be eaten throughout the day, proteins throughout the day that are different kinds of proteins um, and super high fiber foods are fantastic for dental health. They enrich for a diverse ecosystem in the mouth and patients tend to have less epithelial and mucosal inflammation period from mouth to anus. So it's associated with really good health. Yeah, I can tell when looking at a patient's mouth who has a really clean diet. Cause I've, I've started asking that question now. I'm like, man, your gums look amazing. They're just really firm. Yeah. There's no bleeding. You know, the tissue is very stippled and tight. You know, tell me about your diet. And those are typically my whole food patients that are, you know, very mindful. They're not doing a lot of sugar. They're not doing processed foods. Yeah, it's very apparent. Yeah, but the thing is, is, you know, if you have a high stress, lifestyle. You tend to produce a lot of cortisol that has a tendency of enriching for certain kinds of microbes also, because they actually love that environment and use the cortisol. So a lot of candida is found in patients that eat cleanly, but are super type a plus plus stress freaks. And they can have massive perio just because of who can grow in those situations and who likes those situations. So it's, it's not just diet. It's also environment too, and stress. 
Um, but boy, it's so much easier to control diet than it is stress. <laughs> right. right. For sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I let patients off the hook for that too. Cause they're telling me, you know, I'm eating really well and I'm doing all my home care. And then I start asking like, what's happening in life? How stressed are you? Oh, I'm really stressed. Okay. Yeah. Cause a lot of people don't realize that we do secrete that cortisol into the sulcus area as well. It's flowing yeah. throughout and it does feed those bad pathogens. Yeah. 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 Yep. Mm -hmm. A lot of, so there's, um, so microbes in the GI tract, again, the mouth is part of the GI tract that often gets ignored, um, is the fastest absorber. That's why some of the biggest angina meds are sublingual administration because it's really fast absorption. Um, and so there we have trillions of little factories that are secreting things and pumping things out every second of every minute of every day and we're absorbing them right um and and so that's just kind of what i want to hit home is like the healthier more diverse the microbial constituents are in the mouth the overall healthier systemically and dentally someone's going to be and you can't just um you know, even having a some spirochetes can be perfectly tolerable if there's enough beneficial microbes around them that keep them at bay. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, in some publications that I've seen uh, suggest that even like one to three percent of the entire compartment, if it's porphyromonas of the certain aggressive strains, it's like the bully that turns all all the neighboring microbes around it into bullies as well. And creates this really uh, raucous environment that's very upsetting to the tissue um, and to the immune system not, and also the nervous system. And no one's talking about the nervous system yet in gingival health, but that's also a big component. We've done a lot of memory care work. When those patients um, have really peripheral neuropathy, significant peripheral neuropathy, vascularization of the gingiva is super low. And the microbes there are a lot of fungus saprophytes that are just eating uh, that tissue. And so it's it's a really sad thing to see. And I don't, <laughs> so the, the more you can prevent that, the better. And they're linking a lot of dementias to a, a thing called type three diabetes. So we have type one, which is autoimmune, type two is diet and type three is diet also. And uh, highly associate both two and three are now associated with a lot of microbes that correlate strongly with gingivitis. So, um, cause they like to create leakiness, um, cause they're, they need heme in order to survive. So there's a lot going on that we're still trying to understand. And you guys are literally in the trenches every day, <laughs> you know, really trying to keep things at bay all day long. Yeah. 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 Yep. Well, and, and I'm glad that you brought up the aspect of candida, because my understanding in that is candida is able to almost envelop the pathogens. Oh. Is, that, is that accurate? Yeah. So there's in the mouth is a microbe called malassezia. It covers a lot of us. It, it causes dandruff when it produces too much um, waste product. It, it's really a pro-inflammatory. Um, it hangs out in the, in the sulcus uh, candida does too. And then aspergillus, uh, are the, some of the big, big ones we've been looking at. And they are interesting because they can form these little, uh, symbiotic relationships with the neighboring bacteria and, and really kind of almost act like a super organism to do things. Yeah. That's, it's so scary how these things all work so well together. Yeah. Um, one thing I do want to ask, because I know this has been, like you said, there's still a lot we don't know. There's still a lot we're learning. It's a very yeah. exciting time to be in dentistry. Um, it's also a little nerve wracking because as we learn all this, we're like, oh my gosh, what do we do about this? Yeah. Um, and so I know one of the tactics that has come out and I've been trying myself thus far, and I wanted some feedback from you as a microbiologist is the concept of trying to use probiotics in the mouth. You know, and the, the concept being, hey, we're going to get in there, we're going to disrupt this biofilm, we're going to, you know, get out, flush out as much of the pathogen as we can, and then see what we can rebuild with a probiotic. Tell me how, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so in, in theory, probiotics make sense. Um, in practice, what we've actually seen in our studies mm -hmm. are that if someone has, or a dog, a cat, or a human, 
has um, a pathogenic biofilm. Could be super karyogenic or could be um, super periodontal. Uh, the microbes are spewing out antimicrobial agents. Um, uh, we're trying. We're working on what they are. I, um, so they. It looks like they're both protein and small molecule, and they're telling all the neighboring beneficial guys they're giving them stop signals uh, from a growth perspective. So they're actually inhibiting the, the, the growth of beneficial microbes. Include, and we've done studies showing that we can take what they're secreting, put it on a ton of CFUs of viable lactobacillus or bifido probiotic strains. Those strains don't grow. They don't grow. Um, and so uh, what we've been doing is trying to stop the microbes from making those stop signals. And we can, in fact, um, when we pre-treat with our little dietary program, uh, the, we're able to get outgrowth of the probiotics finally. So, you know, and that might be why there has not been any real, real clinical evidence that probiotics work. And I mean, we've been working on probiotics. I've been, you know, I'm a microbiologist. So They've been in the literature since I was in graduate school and, you know, applying it to skin or gut or now mouth and sinus. And there's very little statistical significance between um, the placebo and, and a probiotic so far to date. Got it. Okay. So let's be honest. At this point, this conversation feels very heavy because- Sorry. Oh my gosh, all the tools that we have in our tool belt and everything we've been trying um, doesn't seem to have a real big long-term impact on really managing this very complex, complicated biofilm. So I started this podcast saying I'm very excited to have you with us today because you have created something that's revolutionary. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Tell us about what you have created and what it does and why it is effective. Yeah. So when my grandmother had a stroke, I flew and grabbed her biofilm. My, I used my own biofilm and then I used pretty much everybody I, I could get to give me a sample. And I literally did high throughput screening and I bought everything on the market, triclosan, you know, which used to be in Colgate, acetylpyridine chloride, which is in Crest. Um, I, you know, fluoride, I got all the kinds of fluorides you can buy um, detergents, everything. And then I, um, also bought individual ingredients that are naturally safe. The whole list of grass ingredients that the F FDA has, I bought every single one and did high throughput titration screening on our biofilms to see, um, what can stop the growth of the bad and what can induce the growth of the good. And so we came up with a, a combination of naturally safe ingredients. One is called a postbiotic technically. It's made by soil bacteria. Um, it's like a non-fermentable molecule. So microbes can't break it down, but it's tricking them into thinking that it's sugar. And so they're literally, their machinery is grabbing on um, and it's too big so they can't bring it in and they don't have any equipment to cut it up because it's, it's just dirt, it's indestructible. Like, 98% passes right through the GI tract in, in people and animals. And so um, they're just in the bound state, starving from of sugar. And then we're, we're sending a, a prebiotics. Uh, to, one is a uh, vitamin B6, which is a cofactor that's essential for, for machinery involved in uh, amino acid breakdown. And then we're also giving them the amino acid L-arginine to start breaking L-arginine down first. And that's stimulating what's called the urea cycle in bacteria, which generates nitrate, nitrite, and nitric oxide. And that's super important for gingival health because we're finding that a lot of perio patients, are, their microbes are not making enough. Right. Um, in fact, hardly any measurable amounts. And so we're we're actually causing the microbes to make it again and putting them on a, what's a little ketogenic diet, basically not the, not us, but just the oral microbes. Right. And that's having a reduction in inflammation. Obviously you're sugar starving. So you're not going to make the organic acids. 
that are feeding the, the periopathogens and also causing demineralization of the enamel and then also leaky gums. So it's like a one-two punch of benefit that we've been working with now for over 13 years. That, that's incredible. What is, what is the re research showing you thus far? Yeah. So we've done, um, we, we've in memory care, we can, um, eradicate multi-drug resistant microbes, including candida that's multi-drug resistant, um, in the mouths of these patients, which helps their systemic health too, because bed sores, pneumonia rates, urinary tract infections, gut inflammation problems, all are linked somehow to the mouth. So by getting rid of the reservoir that is affecting the downstream, uh, you know, infl inflammatory conditions or infections is actually a good thing for outcomes. And then, um, in, um, gingivitis patients, we showed that in six weeks, we were able to really statistically significantly, um, block, uh, bleeding. So gum bleeding, uh, uh BOP scores really significantly improved in comparison to sugar alcohols. Cause we were asking ourselves, well, sugar alcohols are used all the time in oral hygiene products and really what is their effect? Because theoretically they're also affecting sugar in a different way as a decoy, right? How is that, uh, uh, how does that relate to our, the effect that our um, approach is having? Um, and it is, it is very different. Um, so just by our approach, this little ketogenic diet, um, protectin is able to literally block and reduce the uh, red complex in patients in six weeks, correlate strongly with improvement in modified gingival index score, and decreases in uh, BOP scores, which is awesome. Interestingly, we've also got prelim data that suggests that sugar alcohols uh, induce an exacerbation of um, uh, gum erosion um, and detachment in that six week time frame compared to um, our protectant approach, which actually um, increased or improved. Wow. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't think we've really pointed this out yet, but the, the product that you've created, it's called daily dental care. Mm -hmm. And you just said something about candida. So does it, does it affect both the pathogens and candida as well? Yeah. So microbes like E. coli, strep, MRSA, um, other forms of staph, um, Klebsiella, uh, Salmonella, candida, they all use sugar to grow. Got it. So what are the mechanisms of delivery for this, this product? Yeah. So daily dental care has got right now we're out in the market with, um, lozenges pretty soon we'll have mints so people can just pop them. They're a cheaper version than the lozenge. Um, we'll have water additives so folks can be drinking it throughout the day, um, or add it to things to neutralize, um, the microbes from taking in sugar and like sugary beverages and things like that. Uh, and then we're coming out with toothpaste as well. Very so, exciting. Yeah. What's your, what's the recommendation for usage? Like you just said, yeah. it can help neutralize stuff. So is this something that we do pre-meal, post-meal? Is it a once a day, twice a day? What, what does that look like? Yeah. So in all of our work, um, all the data points to take it as much as you can throughout the day after you eat even before you eat is fine as well, as long as it's really close before you eat, but no one really likes to pop a mint before they eat lunch. Right, right. So, you know, we're just saying immediately after, cause there is that, you know, 30 minute ish, 25 to 30 minute ish uh, period of time where, where there's this massive conversion of sh dietary sugars to acid, you know, after someone eats or drinks something that has um, sugar in it. So as soon as you're done eating, just pop it in particularly if you can't, even if you can't brush your teeth, um, studies, we've done some studies showing that even if you brush your teeth, you're just smearing the microbes around, but you're not changing what they're doing. They're right. still going to ferment sugar and you're going to, um, because of the way that, that, the saliva works and the curricular fluid works, there's a constant recircle, recycle, um, recirculating of of fluids, right? So at, throughout the day, as you're digesting, the simpler sugars are going to wind up repopulating that curricular fluid again, and the microbes get a, get another meal. So they're continually feeding 
even though you're not actually eating and that can last quite a while. So salivary pH drops, you know, within 30 minutes after you eat, but crevicular pH, you know, can, can go up and down and up and down and up and down based on how you're digesting, uh, and, uh, the food and, and it, as it recycles back through the bloodstream and plasma into the crevicular fluids. Yeah, that's, that's really something that I hadn't thought much about the long-term ramifications of that. So that's really cool. Yeah. Um, especially take it before you go to bed. Cause when you're sleeping, salivary production obviously goes down which is a good thing. Otherwise you'd choke all over yourself sleeping, but, um, it really makes it, um, you vulnerable because they are churning out tons of waste products while you're sleeping and you're just absorbing them passively through the mucosa. Um, and so it's really important to continue to keep them blocked because they're still feeding on that sugar that you ate for dinner. Um, and that's what somebody, people really need to, to, to realize. Yeah. Um, so one thing we haven't really dug into a ton, but I know you've also created products for pets, for dogs and yes. cats, because they also carry these pathogens. They also can have periodontal issues. Um, and so I'm really interested in your research and study finding on those products because, you know, we think that we're talking a lot about diet here. A lot of dog food is made up of very simple oh, carbohydrates. Right. So they're, you know, having that similar, those similar kind of diets with sugar, but dogs really don't tend to practice great home care. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> if not it, if any. So I, know. I, I feel like the findings for those products are especially interesting because yeah. they're not even doing that piece. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. So dental disease is through the roof in, in animals, in pets, because um, the kibble and the, the kibble recipes are just the worst thing that could happen to dogs. And all those dental chews on the market full of wheat and rice and potato, which is like actually causing problems, not, not helping. And so, um, and you know, in our, in our questionnaires, about 2% of dog owners brush their dog's teeth regularly within a week's period. And then we're finding also that people are not washing the water bowls and the food dishes on a regular basis with soap and water. And that's just like, yuck right and so um yeah we're we uh we, our animal care line is called teef um t-e-e-f for life and the goal is to keep every single tooth in the mouth of an animal because when you get a tooth pulled like you know lifespan shortens and um it's a sign of bigger problems and so uh yeah we're we've seen some really great results. I mean, up to 92% of middle-aged cats have either gingivitis or gum disease or stomatitis. And then about 80% of dogs by the age of three um, have gum disease and that shortens their lifespan by about a third so far. So it's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. And I, I help patients understand this too, that they can, these, these pathogens are transmissible when we're giving treats and, you know, they're absolutely infectious. And then they lick your face and you just, yep. you know, we, we've done household studies where we look at all the animals in the, in the household, in all the family members, a human family members. And you can definitely see if, if there's a dog or a cat with gum disease, you can see those microbes start to spread uh, within that household. And it's, it is an infectious disease. Gum disease is infectious. And that's what I wish the WHO recognized that they consider it still a non-communicable disease, but it really is communicable. Right. Right. Well, this, I'm very, very excited uh, to dig in and try this uh, with my own family and my own practice. And I'm hoping that it, my listeners are going to also be like, oh my gosh, we got to get, we got to try this out. So I know things are still in the works, but where can we find your product? Um, and is there a wholesale route for dental offices specifically? Yes. And yes. So you can find us at um, primalhealthllc.com. And that's P as in Paul, R I M as in Mary, A L. Um, health, obviously, dot, uh, LLC, because we are an LLC corporation, uh, dot com. I, will, I promise we'll get a little bit more uh, improved in our um, uh, SEO, but uh, we there are two formulations that are now clinically validated. One is Fostinant for humans. The other one is Protectin for humans. And then there's also a hyperlink to TEEF if folks want to investigate Protectin 42 and 30 for dogs and cats, respectively. But um, 
We do offer wholesale pricing. Uh, we do also offer uh, affiliate programs. So we'll just drop ship to clients' homes. And then there's um, a monthly um, uh, uh, checks we send out to our affiliates. So we're, you know, and, and we're also open to white labeling as well. So, um, cause I recognize some dental offices really like, um, branded products that, that reflect their own, uh, professional brand. And so we're open to everything. Our goal is to get our technology in the mouths of everyone as often as possible. So we've, uh, our business model reflects that. Awesome. Well, I'm so grateful for your passion, your ingenuity, and your drive to think outside of the box and come up with such a smart and foundational idea that can have a monumental impact to dentistry and patient health. Um, in light of the enormity of what we're up against when it comes to the biofilm, the complexities, and the, you know, the westernized diet that we're faced with, this concept is truly re revolutionary, and I hope all of our listeners will dig in and check out daily dental care for themselves and their patients. I know I will. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Where can listeners reach you if they have any questions? Yeah, so um, you can email us at um, info at primaltx.com, primal, and then TX, T is in Tom, X is in X-ray, or um, info at dailydentalcares.com. Awesome. Check it out, you guys. I think this is the next uh, big thing coming in, in dentistry and hygiene. We're going to help our patients the best we can. So we know better. Now it's time to do better. Thank you so much, Dr. Stein, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.